I am so grateful for the freedoms that we have in this nation. We have a lot to be thankful for. We have a lot to be grateful for. I get to do this. Like we get to assemble. We get to assemble and open up the good book and worship freely. And you have brothers and sisters in Christ in other countries and other nations. And they get killed for that. But we have this freedom. So we are going to celebrate Memorial Day. We're going to have some fun. Tomorrow at 3 o'clock, I, I just figured, I just learned this, but tomorrow at 3 o'clock, you're supposed to stop barbecuing and take a minute of silence and just reflection. I did not know that one. That's cool, huh? So tomorrow at 3 o'clock, maybe set a timer on your watch or your phone and, and just stop and be grateful for what we get to what we get to celebrate what we get to live in we get to live in this nation that's free obviously a very powerful moving video from a soldier that wrote that the closest thing that i can get to it scripturally it's from John chapter 15, verse 12. And if you even want to think about it, well, in Scripture, there's a lot of uh, military illustrations, if you will. And this is one, this is one of the vehicles that, that uh, the writers use to communicate the truth, of the truth of the Word of God. Jesus says, My command is this, it's a command. Love each other as I have loved you. That's a command. It's not an option. It's not an emotion. Well, I'll love you if I feel like it. It's a command, everybody. So you have to choose love. But Pastor Josh, you don't know my wife. You have to choose love. Love is a choice. Love each other as I have loved you. Now, this is the part that applies to this video. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Amen? Amen. There is no greater love than to lay down a life, and that's modeled by our Savior, it's modeled by those that served. Jesus then says, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a slave does not know what his master's business in, is. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Amen. So I want to just take a moment, and I want to honor our veterans. I want to honor family that have lost. And if you, wanna, if you feel comfortable in standing, will you allow your church to honor you? If there were any veterans that served, if there's anybody that lost a loved one in a war. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> We thank you. We thank you for that sacrifice. And maybe some of you fought, maybe some of you didn't, but you did serve. And we are so grateful for that. All right. Today. Today, I, I feel that I need to be in, in pastor mode. Now, let me explain that. The, <laughs> I, I, need to be pa I need to be pastoral right now. So sometimes the mode is, is teaching. Sometimes I'm up here and I'm teaching. Uh, sometimes I'm healing. Sometimes I'm declaring or prophesying. 
Now today, I, I think I need to pastor the church. There's so much weight. So much heaviness in teaching you a bunch of truth and dropping some knowledge on you is probably the last thing that you need right now. Just telling you what to do. Like we need to walk through what is going on in our nation together as a church. I don't have all the answers, but I know what the scriptures say. The scriptures say that the believer is called to mourn with those that are mourning and to grieve with those that are grieving and to rejoice with those that are rejoicing. Right? So in light of what happened this week, we need, to, we need to mourn with those that are mourning. Now, I know we don't know them personally, and I know that this is something that is happening quite often in our nation. The previous week, there was a, there was a shooting in Orange County at a church Prior to that, there was one in Buffalo. It's kind of a sad thing that I have to do every morning before I come to church. So I have to check the news. Do you want to know why I check the news on Sunday morning before I go to church? Because one time I didn't, something bad happened and I wasn't prepared. If we all agree, there's something fundamentally broken in our society where we're killing our own children. I mean, this is something that we have to, as a church, we have to pray into it. We have to lean into it. I first got pastoral on this issue when Columbine happened. And I'm going to read to you the very same scripture that I read to you. How many years ago was that? 20 years ago? 20 years ago was Columbine. I've learned during my life and dealing with, with problems, and I loved how Landon put it, that we have to nail at the cross that we don't have answers for, that we can't solve within our own power. I loved how Landon said we have to nail it at the foot of the cross, right? That's where it belongs. And I, I've learned that, and I think if you will allow me, this is where I'm going to get pastoral. I've learned inside of me that I've gone through a, a spectrum of emotions when dealing with these kinds of tragedies. When Columbine happened, my initial emotion was fear. Like, I was scared. My friends were scared. There was an uncertainty, like, like wait, something that random can happen? And then, you know, we're dealing with it now, but just seeing the news reels and the, and the clippings and the individuals, and it just, like, there was a fear that, that seized me. And if you're dealing with that emotion now, the, the best thing to do is, is to turn to the Word of God. And the peace of God will transcend that fear state and will lead you into His presence. So fear was, was my initial emotion when this happened. So maybe you guys are dealing with, with fear. I don't remember what shooting it was. So a couple years ago, it was a Sandy Hook. Sandy Hook was a different emotion for me. Sandy Hook, I was angry. Like there was this, this right, an indignant righteousness that just bubbled up, and I was angry. We did prayer vigil. We, did all, we were very active on that one as a church. But then I just remember just being ticked off, just so angry. This one, the emotion was disgust. It was disgust. And so let me read you the scripture that I read when this first happened. Uh, this is Luke. Oh, I lost my spot. Luke 12. Uh, verse 3. Uh, 
I'll go to verse 2. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight. And what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the rooftops. Uh, this truth applies to everybody. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do nothing more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear, whom, fear him whom, after killing the body, has the power to throw you into hell. And yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs on your head are numbered. Do not be afraid. You are worth more than the sparrows. I tell you, whoever acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will acknowledge him before the angels of God. But he who disowns me before men will be disowned before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But if anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, he will not be forgiven. All right, lots there. But what I want you to focus on and what we focused on 20 years ago. Do not be afraid of those that can kill the body. That's a, that's a tough statement. Saying we shouldn't fear death. As a believer, we should walk in such a confidence that you should not fear death. A couple weeks ago, I was almost hit by a car. I was kind of scared. The adrenaline hit my system, right? I get that's okay. And we're, I'm not talking about that. I've shared this story. Um, so bear with me if you've heard it before. Here it comes again. Uh, I was once in Eastern Europe uh, buying antiques that I probably shouldn't have been buying. And I, was, I found myself in an antique store out in the middle of nowhere, and I'm trying to communicate with this guy in broken German. I'm telling him that I want to buy more stuff than what he's got, and then he says, oh, you, you know, American antique dealer. And so he takes me down in the basement. He starts unlocking all these doors and unbolting things and unchaining things and opens up this big door. And I, and I walk into this basement full of Nazi memorabilia. Hitler bus and uniforms, machine guns. And I'm like, I'm at flags. And I'm starting to get really creeped out. I'm feeling really uncomfortable. I actually bought a painting from him. It's upstairs in my office right now. <laughs> and he's eccentric. He was weird. And he got really excited. And I understand it now, but I didn't understand it then. He got really excited, he opened up a drawer. He pulls out a pistol. And he says something in German, ex super, meaning that he's got a really nice pistol. That's what it meant in German. But I didn't know that, and he's pointing it at me. So I'm like, okay, Lord, here I come. <laughs> and No, I'm serious, because I thought he was going to kill me. I really did. And I had, like, in that moment, I had that, that prayer that said, okay, God, am I okay? So the adrenaline hit my system, and by the time I was able to settle down, I'm like, God, God am I okay with you? And then there was just peace. I'm like, all right, if this crazy person shoots me, I know I'm going to be okay. And that's, like, you have to have that. Like, you have to have that peace. Like, that is such an amazing gift. Now, I'm not saying that you're gonna, you shouldn't be afraid of, you know, bears in the forest. I'm not saying that, um, you know, that you should just, 
you know, walk in the street and not worry about a Mack truck kid hitting you. And I'm talking about that kind of fear. I'm talking about, you know, the peace of God that can transcend any situation. And you're not worried about the man that can destroy the body. You should be worried about the one that can send you to hell. Two interpretations of that one, by the way. Uh, when you read it initially, you think, well, that's the devil, right? The devil can send you to hell. That's actually probably not the right translation. It's the Lord that sends you there. You actually send yourself there, but uh, he's the one that has the power. We shouldn't fear the devil. We sh Who should you fear? It's in the scriptures. Fear God. The, 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 the source of all wisdom and knowledge is the fear of the Lord. If that's the only thing that you're fearing in this world, then you're in really good shape. You've got nothing else to fear if you fear the Lord. I can't promise you I know what will happen in the future. I can't promise you that if we say a special magic prayer, you're all going to be safe. But I can promise you eternity in heaven, breathing in pure peace without the anxieties that we're feeling right now. I can't promise you that if you make the Lord the Savior of your life. If you allow him to take control, I can promise you that. This week, again, my emotion was discussed. And the word of God says that we need to Mourn with those that mourn, grieve with those that grieve. I feel like the Lord wants me to do this. Um, I, I, I went through it earlier, and I was a little surprised about the second emotion that came, which was sadness and grief and heartbreak. I really feel like the Lord needs me to read these. <laughs> I'm sorry. Alexandra Rubio, age 10. Aletha Ramirez, age 10. And Mary Garza, age 10. Annabella Guadalupe Rodriguez, age 10. Elia Torres, age 10. Ellie Garcia, age nine. Eva Morales, 44. Irma Garcia, 45. Jackie Carza, age 10. Yala Nicole, age 10. J.C. Lavaros, age 10. Jose Flores, age 10. Ayala Salazar, age 10. McKenna Elron, age 10. Maddie Rodriguez, age 9. Miranda Mathis, age 11. Nevia Bravo, age 9. Rolo Torres, age 10. Tess Mata, age 9. Uzziah Garcia, age 10. Xavier Lopez, age 10. Heavenly Father, we lift them up. We grieve with them. We don't have the answers. We don't have the power to fix this. We don't have the power to bring them back. We pray, Lord, that in their communities, in their communities of faith, that they can feel the peace of God. 
God has the church of Jesus Christ represented in this city and in these communities. We ask, we ask for a coming renewal and a revival, a restoration of soul. We ask that we can do our part to create an atmosphere where the kingdom of hell will not prevail. We thank you for your salvation. And yet we are grieving and we are hurt and we are broken. We are a broken society. So God, God please, in your mercy, in your mercy, in your grace, heal our land. Heal our land. Only you can do it. Heal our land, Lord. In your name. The word of God also says to rejoice with those that rejoice. I'm being more pastoral right now. Bad things happen to good people. But so do good things. So... I have a little homework assignment for you today. It's very simple. Is it this coming week? God's going to do something good in your life. And you have to choose to receive it. You can't have the Murphy's Law spirit. You can't go into communion with Murphy in your life. It's not the believer's way. The believer's way is to say, I can do all things to Christ who gives me strength. The believer's way is to say, I am more than a conqueror when I am in Christ. Right. So, God wants to do something good. A little seed here and there. He's going to plant it. Mm -hmm. Like, not, all, not every single bad thing on this planet is going to happen to you. Okay? <laughs> The devil doesn't like you that much. <laughs> when, your, when your blessing comes this week, when God turns towards you, when he is gracious towards you, you have to give him praise. You have to give him thanks, even for the little thing. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a parking spot. Okay, whatever it is. I know that one's a silly one. I know that's a silly one, but even if it's a parking spot, just, just, just give God praise. And, you know, I've had weeks like this, nothing good ever happens to me. Oh, poor oh me. Okay, if that one's you, if, if nothing good ever happens to you, I, I don't know, maybe that is true. Maybe it's true. Maybe nothing good ever happens to you. It says rejoice with those that are rejoicing. So if nothing's good going on in your life, then find somebody that something good is going on and rejoice with them. Because we'll learn in discipleship and in scripture, well, it's just not all about you. So find something good. We need to continue to pray for these communities that have been devastated and hurt. We need to continue to pray for the travesties that are, taking on, that are taking on in Ukraine. We're a broken world. But if you don't balance it out with what God is doing, we're going to be in a dark place. So find what God is doing. And give him praise. Give him worship. All right. Let me try and teach a little bit. You guys okay? All right, let me try and teach a little bit. We're in the series called The Art of Faith, meaning that faith is a little more complicated than, than you might think. And where your faith level was 20 years ago, I guarantee you it should be different now. 
certain expressions, certain paths that the Lord's called you on, they're going to be different than they were in the past. The way that he even communicates with you can change and shift. So there's an art to this. It's a dance. Faith is a bit of a dance. There's sometimes when the Lord is speaking to me and like I, I just can't get out of my Bible. I'm like, my nose is in the book. I can't get away from it. There's other times when the Lord is speaking to me and it is through, the, it's through worship. I don't understand it, but like, you know, here I am, Lord, broken and contrite heart, and he is there to meet me in that moment. Uh, other times it is through the body of believers where the Lord is communicating to me through people. The Lord likes to speak to us in dreams. He likes to speak to us in visions, even in impressions. So it's all about a little bit of a dance. Like, you know, sometimes, you know, you get too, you get too used to a certain way of faith in your life, and God wants to stretch a different faith muscle. But you've just been working on your bicep for 20 years. Like, this is the only faith thing that you can do is this. And you got skinny legs. You know this guy in the gym? Like he's all yoked up up here, but he's got skinny legs. (laughs) Pastor Mandy preached a sermon on Mother's Day. You have to get, you have to watch this one. Go to YouTube, subscribe, you know, pound that subscribe button, whatever. But you need to watch Pastor Mandy's Mother's Day special. Because in that, she talked about the importance of leaving a legacy. The artwork that she chose was Thomas Kincaid. I had to choose to have a good attitude, and I did. (laughs) I'm a big, giant art snob. It's really bad. Legacy. And she quoted... Here's an here's a, an exact quote from Pastor Manny. What legacy does God want you to leave? Do you ever think about that? We probably rarely think about it. Like, what legacy does God want you to leave? What's your legacy? And you're like, I don't know. I don't care. I just want to survive to the next week. And I understand when you are in survival mode. But I want to push you into legacy mode. What story does God want you to tell? What legacy does God want you to leave? And what story does he want you to tell? We all have a story. I can write a story about my life. And I have written my own story. And the Lord read it, and he says, you know what, Josh, your story stinks. (laughs) How about if we co-author the story of your life? And God wants to do that with you. Like, you have a legacy. You have a story. First of all, let let me define what legacy is. A legacy is something that you leave behind for someone else, another generation, you know, your kids, your grandkids, your church family, it is something you leave behind and you never, ever get to reap the rewards of it. You don't get the turn, your return. There is no ROI for you and your legacy. You're dead. You're in the ground. And you can't take your toys with you. So what legacy can you leave and be completely okay with saying, I'm giving this legacy to my family. Maybe it's financial, but maybe it's spiritual. Maybe it is in the way that you carry yourselves or the way that you live your life. You are leaving a legacy. Pastor Manny talked about the legacy of prayer. Are you praying for your kids? Are you laying down that powerful foundation? What legacy are you leaving? There is a powerful legacy in the scriptures, and that's the legacy of King David. Okay, so last week I showed a painting of Edward Hopper, iconic American artist, which in first service, there was a number of people that had never seen it before, so pretty please, with sugar on top. What's that? David. Okay. And who who carved it? 
All right, let's go to the next slide. Thank you. Oh, so you are not a bunch of Philistines. You are somewhat cultured. Thank you. Isn't he great? Look how ginormous he is. And yes, I purposely chose the waist up option because this is church and you'd have to like wash your eyes out if I showed you the real work. Ah, he's stunning. One little wrong tap, and the whole thing would have cracked. It is a prime piece of Carrera marble. And it is the iconic human form. His head's a little big for his body, but you know what? Most gym guys, that's true, right? It looks like my mom. Oh, yeah, yeah, it does, doesn't it? It looks like my mom there trying to touch David. I totally agree. Isn't that weird? Oh, my goodness. Okay, I knew this was going to happen. So in this series on telling your story with God, God co-authoring your life story, it's going to be a two-parter. We'll have to pick it up next week because this is too too much to go on. Uh, But let's read. um, We're going to do David and Goliath. 1 Samuel, First Samuel, we'll go with um, chapter 17, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 45. Okay, and you know the story, everybody knows the story of David and Goliath. It is a classic. Not only is it a classic, it is, quite honestly, and maybe even from this point, it is bred into our collective consciousness. It's in our DNA, the David and Goliath story. Corporations use this illustration, and philosophers use this illustration. Everybody loves the story of the boy that was weak, that was disenfranchised, They had no place in society, and he takes on a giant. How many people love these stories? I love these. How many people love Robin Hood? I do. It is iconic, and it is, again, it's in our collective consciousness. The David and Goliath story. A little weak individual overcoming tyranny. And Well, there's two ways that that we need to look at David. We need to look at David from a corporate perspective or a church corporate perspective. So as the church of Jesus Christ, it may feel at times that we are weak, that we have no power, that we are divided, that we're putting on armor that doesn't belong to us. Amen? And yet, through the power of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can tear down strongholds. So, as a community, as the body of Christ, the church is David. Second idea is that so are you, boys and girls. David goes on a journey of legacy. He goes on an incredible journey. His story is told over and over and over again through literature. Luke Skywalker Harry Potter, Knights of the Round Table, or King Arthur. Now, that, that, it's all that story, retold, rehashed. So we get it. We can identify with it. And I need to get to the heart of his success. The Philistines... The Philistines were nasty people. They were the ancient version of the Vikings. They were rude. They were crude. They worshipped all kinds of evil idols. And they had a really big one, Goliath. We know this. David is 
one of eight children. David is the youngest of the eight. And when the wizard, when, when Samuel is trying to find the next king, because the first king's not working out too hot, when Samuel, the wizard, goes and, and, and looks for the next King Arthur, the next, you know, Harry Potter, you know, Jesse presents all of his amazing sons. They're tall, they're handsome, they're dark-haired. And he forgets about the eighth one, who was ruddy and maybe red-haired, and he wasn't presented. Now, scholars and theologians are reading into the scripture. We don't know for sure, but there might have been something going on there. He might not have been a, a full brother. He was left outside. He was left on the, on the skirts. And Samuel notices his anointing. He notices that this one is called. And he brings him in and he anoints his head with oil. And then years later, because of that, that anointing, because the man of God saw the potential in the individual, he steps into this battlefield where there is no way of winning. This is exciting stuff. There's no way of winning this battle. But here is David's attitude. And as the church of Jesus Christ, this is the attitude that we need to have. This is our perspective. It is not a Murphy's Law perspective. You come against me, David is saying this to the giant in the, in the field. You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, all right? The weapons of war. You're coming against me with your technology. And it is a technological age. We are moving from Bronze Age into Iron Age. The weapons are highly advanced. They're faster, they're sharper, they're heavier, it's meaner. The warfare changes. I come against you. In the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. And so right there, that's the mindset. That's the mindset of somebody that is writing their story with God, that is choosing victory with the Lord over finding their own power. Prior to this, he puts on Saul's armor, and he doesn't like the weight of it. He doesn't like Saul's technology. And he takes it off. He says it doesn't fit well doesn't fit well on me. I don't like how it feels. I need, to, I need to be how God has created me to be. He is saying that the weapons and the tools and the strategies of this world do not work in the kingdom of heaven. Now, yes, we know that David had this little sling and he threw a rock and it knocked the guy out. But he didn't even need that. Do you know that? He didn't even need that bit of technology. He, he doesn't say, it's going to be my slingshot that's going to take you down. It's going to be my power. It's going to be my skill. He gives all the credit and all the glory to the Lord even before it happens. Amen? Amen. I know a lot of you are you're smart cookies. A lot of you are hard workers. A lot of you are pull yourself up by the bootstraps kind of people. God's blessed you and he's gifted you in that. But here's the big challenge. What could you possibly accomplish? What legacy could you leave? What story could you write if you relied on God's power and not yours? Aaron, how much time do I have? I've got this. I was sharing with, with George earlier this week that there was a season when I was the antique dealer. I know I bring this up a lot, but it's just really good stories. I can't help it. <laughs> there was a season when I was buying uh, lots of cemetery art. In France, when you died, 
some 100 years ago or 200 years ago. They did it upright. There's marble statues like the David. You got a really pretty angel. Almost every grave marker had this incredible uh, cast iron cross. Like just like works of art. So like when you died, like they just made your cemetery piece, like they just made it awesome. Some of them, you know, like if you had some money, maybe they put you in a vault, you know, and then they carved angels all over the place. Just glorious. Well, some hundred years later, nobody really cares. They had entire cemeteries. I mean, not just one or two, but entire communities all over the country where people were not visiting the grave sites anymore. No one cared. No one visited. And they were falling, in, they were falling into ruin. And the government was going in and reclaiming the bodies, putting all the statues and all the iron crosses and all the artwork. Well, probably fell off some trucks. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and they just, plowed the, they just plowed the cemetery under and they sold the real estate. So I made a lot of money by selling that stuff. We just shipped it over here and all these designers ate it up and bought it. Now, my point is, these people died and they thought that they were leaving a legacy but it had absolutely no impact because nobody visited them anymore. Um, I have a picture of an old creepy cemetery. Creepy cemetery. Where is it? Oh, did you get it? No? All right, there it is. Not that one. <laughs> there we go. So like this. Like these are all over Europe. They're all over California. Go to Bodie. No one goes and visits them anymore. No one cares. If you're an environmentalist, this is immoral to take up space, to manufacture an iron coffin that no one really cares about anymore, or to pump you know, some dead relative full of formaldehyde. I've done too many funerals lately. I'm getting bitter. Yesterday, I took a tour of a different type of a cemetery. They had me come out. They wanted me to look at it. It's a new thing that they're doing. This is up in Lake Arrowhead. Let's go to the next picture. This is also a cemetery. Isn't that nice? And so what this company is doing is like, it's like okay, we're going to leave a legacy. We're going to cremate your loved one. We're going to mix them in, in, in soil. We're going to plant them in an established tree. We're going to preserve a forest. We're going to manage that forest. And then we're going to plant some, you know, 800 trees in your name. That's a legacy. That's, going, that's something that's going to reproduce. That's something that's going to continue to bless. Even when all the relatives forget who the relative was that died, there's still going to be growth. There's still going to be a new thing taking on. One major thought that I'm going to send you off with is that God wants you to have a legacy. God wants you to have a story. And it's not just about fixing you. God does not want to fix you. God wants to make you brand new. Our relatives that are in a cemetery somewhere, God's not going to resurrect that old body. He doesn't care. It's all, it's in bad shape. Like there's nothing there, there's nothing good there anymore. No, he's got the DNA all locked up into heaven. He's going to create something brand new. And that's what he wants to do with you in your life right now. When you begin to write this story with him, it's not the same old story. It's going to become a new story. He's going to make you a new creature. Even if you've been walking with the Lord for a very long time, 
He's all about making something new. Again, he doesn't want to just fix your problems. He wants you to make you a new creation. Amen? Amen. All right, band, come on up. Oh, I need the elements. Did everybody get an element? Thank you, Mark. Back to our initial scripture, our first scripture that we read this morning. No greater love has than this than someone to lay down their life for a friend. Did you know that Jesus, the creator of the universe, who now sits at the right hand of the Father, everything that has been made for him and everything that is made by him, he calls you friend. And he laid down his life for you as a friend. There's a deep mystery there, but it's a profound truth. Receive the body of Christ. Become a part of the body of Christ. Hear his voice in the midst of the body. And practically begin to rewrite your story from the right platform, the platform of the body of Christ. Receive the body of Christ for your provision. And this, my friends, is where the newness takes place. Scriptures say that we become new every morning. If you come to church, you can at least become new every week. But you can become new every day, every moment. Without the shedding of innocent blood, without that sacrifice of a friend for you, there is no forgiveness of sins. There is no eternal resting place. There is no hope without this cup. So receive the cup of Jesus, the blood shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins.
If you don't know the Lord is your Savior, if you don't know where you're going to be, you got to reach out to us. I don't, I don't want to do a, a cheesy altar call. I want it to be real. If you want to know the Lord, if you want that confidence of walking in Elysian fields for eternity. Get with a pastor. Get discipled. Be faithful to the Lord. He will be faithful to you. Your homework for this week. Yes, Go through those myriad of emotions, anger, fear, disgust, sadness. Grieve with those that are grieving. But also, don't stay in that muck in the mire. Rejoice with those that are rejoicing. Give praise to God for the good thing that he has done in your life. If you don't have anything this week, praise God with somebody else. And you just watch the blessings of the Lord come rolling in. He is so good. He is so faithful. So now may the Lord bless you as you begin to write your story with him. May the Lord keep you under his wings, in his shadow. May the Lord bless you and cause his face to shine upon your life, to bring everything out into the open, everything out into the lights. May the Lord fill your home with the peace of God that transcends all of this world's evil static. You can have a peaceful environment if you allow the Holy Spirit to come in your home to begin to redecorate it. May He fill your home with peace. May He make you prosperous in His ways. God bless you guys. Hang out with us. We're going to have a lot of fun on our Memorial Day picnic. I hear there's going to be some shenanigans. God bless you guys. Have a great week.